Good afternoon. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute of International and European Affairs in Dublin. I'd like to welcome you to this second event in our inaugural IIEA Disability Policy Series. And today's event concerns the subject of access to education for persons with disabilities in Europe. Thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. I'm delighted to have Dr. Vivian Rath from Trinity College Dublin and a head in the chair today. Viv, thanks a million for making the time. I'm going to hand over to Vivian, who will introduce our speakers and who will go through some housekeeping. Viv. Thank you, Barry, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And thank you to the IIEA for uh, hosting the second uh, webinar on the experiences of disabled people in Ireland and the EU. It is very welcome to see the disability agenda being mainstreamed within the IIEA agenda, and long may it continue. Okay, so before I uh, before we begin today, I have just some small housekeeping uh, pieces that I need to go through. And that's just a note for our, the, our webinars. Please note that both the initial address and the Q&A session are on the record on, unless otherwise stated. Um, we would invite you to submit your questions via the Q&A function on Zoom and we will always do our absolute best to get to every question. And really, I look forward to those questions because they really add an, a whole new dimension to the uh, webinar. Uh, I would ask you to identify yourselves when, and your affiliation uh, when uh, submitting your question. And uh, that uh, I would also just note that we have uh, ISL interpreters here today and closed captioning. And I would uh, ask you to avail of them. Now on to the more interesting aspect. Well, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers here today, and I'm really um, pleased to be in a position to chair this webinar uh, and to hear both the lived experience here today, uh, but also, of course, we will hear the policy and the academic experience, and we're going to bring it all together uh, to pr pr produce, I'd imagine, a wonderful picture of the context and the policy aspect in the EU in relation to access to education for persons with disabilities. I'm only going to give, uh, even though our speakers uh, have quite a, a long list of achievements, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to give a, a, just a quick line or two on each. Our keynote speaker, Sai Fien, is a graduate of the Trinity Centre for People with Intellectual Disabilities in the School of Education, Trinity College, Dublin, and has vast experience and lived experience of disability and also, of course, from her own work. We have Professor Michael Shevlin, who is a professor in inclusive education and director of the Trinity Centre for People with Intellectual Disabilities in Trinity College, Dublin. We have Delia Ferry, a professor of law at Minute University, School of Law and Criminology, and co-director of the M Minute University Assisted Living and Learning All Institute. And then we have Michael Teusch, head of Unish Schools and Multilingualism in the European Commission's Directorate General for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture. And these brilliant speakers will be here today to share their views, their experiences, and I'm expecting a very interesting panel discussion of which I'd imagine you will learn a, a vast amount. It, it, it is important to remember that the UNCRPD uh, focuses uh, on inclusive education and the right that supports persons with disabilities to earn a livelihood, to live independently and participate within the community and in the, with the aim of reducing the risk of poverty. The UNCRPD committee recognizes some groups, including persons with intellectual disabilities or multiple disabilities, persons who are deaf blind and persons with autism are at greater risk of exclusion with in education. And today we will focus uh, on hearing the experiences of some of those groups, but also the barriers and enablers. enablers. Um, I'm now going to move quickly on to our um, speakers and our keynote, because I know that's what you really want to hear. You don't want to hear me talking. We want to hear Saif Fihan 
giving her experience and, and sharing that experience with us. So Saiv, I'm going to pass over to you. Uh, everybody is really excited to hear what you have to say. Hi, hello, sorry. <laughs> hello everyone. My name is Saif Fihin and I am an executive officer in the School of, e of Education in Trinity College, Dublin. I have a mild intellectual disability and dyspraxia, which means I find organizational skills um, and writing a long period, for a long period of time difficult. <clears throat> My educational background. I attended a mainstream secondary school in Carlow, which was brilliant because it was a, a secondary school who that had um, people who had who have um, intellectual disabilities and so on. Um, because I have a I have a keen because I have a keen interest in animals. I then applied for a course in animal care in the College of Further Education in Cardo, which was my which was my first ever experience in college, which was um it was a it was a really good experience. Um, I found some of the subjects difficult in the course, but I did get some help when needed when I when I needed it. Uh, some of the examples that um some of the examples for the, from some of the court, some of the subjects I found difficult was um, the maths and animal anatomy. Um, when it came to the exams, I had a scribe, which was extremely helpful, who helped me, and um, who helped me with the exams. And in the end, I I ended up passing all my exams at the end of the course. My introduction to Trinity College Dublin. My parents heard about the Trinity Center for People with Intellectual Disabilities, TCPID, and their certificate in arts, in arts, science, and inclusive applied practice course at a conference. One of the TCPID, one of the TCPID graduates, Margaret Hurley, was presenting at the conference, and my parents knew that I would love this course, so I put in an application. <clears throat> I was so excited when I heard, when I got the letter to say that that I got a place. The excitement was huge, and to make it even more exciting is that my sister and my dad both went to Trinity College, and they both studied here as well. So that made the excitement tenfold. <clears throat> my time as a student in Trinity College, Dublin. Starting college in 2018 was such a huge, such an exciting time because I never thought I would ever get to get the chance to go to college. Um, I had two friends join, joining me on this exciting journey. One of them was a year ahead of me in the course and the other one was starting with me in class, in my class. It was great to have the company on the train on the way up to Dublin. Going to college really it really helped me to become more confident and independent. What made the art, science, and inclusive applied practice course great was that everyone was treated the same, and no one was treated treated, treated any differently. What I enjoyed in Trinity College Dublin, I loved being on campus with all the other TCD students. I enjoyed chatting with other students from different courses while waiting to wait while, while while waiting to go into class, and I would ask them what they what they would do, what they do, what, what course they doing they're doing, and I was in turn say what I, what I did. I enjoyed meeting up with my classmates for lunch and coffee, chat and coffee. Um, I loved learning new things. One of my favorite subjects was history of art. 
it made me appreciate paintings and other art forms which I never known about before. I love being a college student, just like anyone, just like everyone else. My happiest day in Trinity College. My absolute happiest day in Trinity College was my graduation day. We had done a lot of our course online due to COVID, due to the COVID pandemic. Well, we made the most of it. Um, we were we were brought back on campus for a very special graduation ceremony. The provost of Trinity College, Trinity College, Linda Doyle, gave us our such certificates. My graduate internship in A and L, good body. What did I do in ANL? Good buddy. I posted about events on their internet websites, Alice and Yammer. I helped organize events for different events, for for example, the quiz for the Calcutta run and the Pride event. I also learned how to use the printer and the scanner. What did I find difficult when I started? Trying to remember all the names, find my way around the building and getting used to working in an office. What helped me to settle in, my mentor and my colleagues? My graduate internship in Trinity College. I started the internship in, in the CCPID in Trinity College in September, 2022. My tasks, my tasks include office administration, student support, student societies, and in the student societies, I am working now. I'm now working with the student management fund, who are trying, who are going to be making sure that the the societies are more inclusive to our students, and be able to so they'll be able, be able to understand the you know the make sure yeah make sure they're more inclusive for students. The open days and TY programs. Guest like uh, the guest lectures, which are basically us giving uh, my class of my class giving our lived experiences to the student teachers, so they'll be able to take what we learn, what we what the knowledge we have, and they'll be able to take that into their learning. And um, business partners presentations, and the most recent um, presentation the. And I presented in, at the conference in Salzburg in October 2022. <clears throat> why is why is it important for people with disabilities to attend higher education? It gives students a sense of belonging. It shows that students with disabilities are just as important as everyone else. It demonstrates that, that all students of all abilities should be given the same opportunities. Why is it important that students with intellectual disabilities get the proper support? This is important because some students need support to make learning a bit easier. For example, it may help some students to get the, to get the notes before classes. It will not only help the students, but it, would all, but it would also help the lecturer to understand that what each student might need. Thank you. Any questions? Slave, thank you very much. <laughs> that was a much. fantastic presentation. Uh, thank you. You could take a minute there now to, uh, to, to gather your thoughts. And whilst you're doing that, I just had one little question uh, before we go over to Michael, because it was really interesting and I thought especially one of the points that I thought was really important was that idea of opportunity and mm -hmm. that it's giving uh, everybody the upper people with intellectual disabilities opportunities like everybody else and I think yes. that was really important Thank and you. I know that since you've completed uh, your studies uh, mm -hmm. you've gone on to obtain full-time employment yes. uh, in the Trinity Centre for people with intellectual disabilities. And I'm just wondering, what difference has it made for you to have a full-time job now? Oh boy, I suppose it gives me a sense of security, knowing that I don't have to worry about not having somewhere, 
like you know a job and knowing th and also it gives me a sense of achievement as well because you know coming from being a student in the course to actually working here um, is huge it's just been amazing an amazing feeling and I feel valued like I feel like I'm a valued um, member of staff and I feel that I can make changes and give ideas that help students with intellectual disabilities um, you know to make to make them feel like that they're not any different to anyone else yeah that's yeah absolutely um, is there anything else you'd like that yes um, it's important to have something, I find it's very important to have something um, productive and uh, rewarding to do and be appreciated for your efforts, uh, for my efforts, and also feel a sense of belonging. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and there, there you've mentioned some really important points there, that mm -hmm. word belonging, and it certainly sounds like you're part of the team uh, <laughs> in Trinity and you're you're mm -hmm. you're bringing about change as well of course uh, which is a yep. critical aspect and you should be very proud of that and well done <laughs> i have loads of other questions for you but i'm not going to <laughs> ask you now because okay. i'm going to give you a little break um and mm -hmm. i'm going to pass on to professor michael shevlin um michael um having heard Sive's presentation uh, would you be able to give us a little more background on the center and where it all began and maybe perhaps you'd also be able to give us uh, some context uh, in, in relation to Ireland and educational pathways. Well, as someone said, follow that. Um, <laughs> anyway, thanks for that, Sai. We are obviously delighted to have you as part of our team. And um, I suppose Trinity Centre came from a number of, of different developments and there was an awareness that young people with intellectual disability were often set on a certain path in life. And it had been decided very, very early and often decided once they were diagnosed. And that path was often a very narrow one. It was, uh, and often had a, quite a number of cliff edges, I would suggest that it was very easy to fall over, go into a little limbo, disappear. And so people's trajectory was almost already decided um, before they even maybe even left school, uh, primary school, going into secondary school or into a special school. And as a result of that, then there were very few systems in place to support young people as they try to develop their skills and their knowledge. And we became very conscious of that. And, and there's been a, a program of one kind or another in Trinity probably for the last 20 years. Um, however, I think the big breakthrough really has been developing an accredited program uh, that fits within the national framework of qualifications that is recognizable for employers, but uh, for families, for educators, but particularly for the young people themselves, um, that they know this is a valuable learning experience. And our idea really is we provide a very generic program. It's not a vocational program. And the idea is that young people become successful learners, that they know they can learn and that that's valuable to learn and that they can continue on a, a kind of lifelong journey of learning. And that's kind of been our ambition. And we've learned as we've gone along. The other key element is the link into our business partners. And in second year, our students uh, would have a work placement for eight weeks, eight Fridays, um, learning some of the basic skills of what a workplace looks like, how to be there, uh, when to drink your coffee, when to have your lunch, do all the very, very basic things that we all take for granted in a, in a working environment. And then our, um, our young people will have an opportunity to do a six-month paid internship number of those, again, as Saif has described them, and ANL Goodbody, we have 45 business partners at the moment, uh, and they commit to providing the work placements and also the internships. And gradually what's beginning to happen is that young people are being made permanent, if not in their place of internship, in a follow-on business. And they're making a real contribution. And I think it goes back 
in a way to a whole systemic issue. And that is that because most we have parallel systems really in health, social welfare and education in Ireland. And as a result of that, people are directed one way or the other and health and social welfare sit together. So often a, a young person who has been diagnosed as having a particular type of disability exists in that sphere. And then over here on the other side is education. But often the funding doesn't transfer as the young person moves through the different life stages, moves from primary to secondary. Um, and quite a lot of money is spent on rehabilitation. And I suppose our argument would be the young people don't need rehabilitation. They just need education. And again, as I've said, they need an opportunity to make that real and to have something meaningful in their lives. And there's still a number of stages to go because this, we're really retrofitting the system uh, and making tweaks rather than saying all young people have a right to progress in education. All young people should have these different types of opportunities. And as a result, when that when we start with the all rather than the sum, I think then we begin to change the dynamic. And as you know, when people are named and they're counted, then the resources follow. And that's been the big breakthrough in Ireland um, with the uh, Minister for Further and Higher Education and his officials and the Higher Education Authority. There is now a Path 4 access programme on a pilot basis. And it's anticipated that quite a number of programmes will, will begin throughout the country. Um, for that to affect substantial change, then hopefully the funding mechanisms change as well. And that it's recognized these young people have a right to go to college if there are programs there that they will benefit from, just as we say for every other youngster. Thank you, uh, Michael. And I, I was just one interested, in, and before I go on to Michael, or to Delia, sorry, uh, before I just go on, one one point you mentioned there, and we'll come back to some deeper questions later on, but it's, you mentioned the, the notion of work placements versus work experience. Um, mm -hmm. And may, maybe could you explain that? Because I think, you know, I, I, I know from my own experience from other disabled people that many disabled people get caught up in a cycle of work experience, unpaid work experience after unpaid work experience. And I'm just interested to hear what's the difference uh, in, in having a work placement uh, in, your, in the programme? I suppose the thanks for the question there, Vivian. It's an important. We make a distinction if the work placement that is part of the program isn't paid, but it's very much it's like an internship, as in learning. So it's still part of the learning, and there is an assessment at the end of that. How have they participated? What have people learned? What have the young people learned from that experience? The next stage is radically different they are guaranteed a six month paid internship and it's not minimum wage, it's a decent wage. Um, and the idea behind that is that their work is valuable. While they're learning and learning skills, they are making a contribution. And it's from that then, we obviously have a business pathways coordinator. We also have two occupational therapists who work with us very, very much as part of the team. And they visit the business, and we ask the business to have a mentor from within the business who is a work buddy. The traditional model has been to have a job coach. And while some job coaches do a great job, the temptation is always that the people in the business, the colleagues speak to the job coach. And the young person then is sort of, everything is mediated. Um, and our idea really is that we want to become fully embedded in the businesses. Like most of our businesses, uh, quite a number have been with us now seven, eight years, and they keep signing up, which is great. Um, but they're also committing themselves. They've moved way, way, way beyond corporate social responsibility. It's really into that 
inclusion and diversity. They want a diverse workforce, but they want to know how can we do this well? How can we do this in the best way that we can? So we provide some supports, but really our idea is that over time, the capacity comes from within the business, that we build that capacity and the confidence. And we're just seeing more and more examples of it. Quite a few of our young people now are, are being made permanent um, with permanent contracts, and they go through every process. It is mediated to some extent with reasonable accommodations, obviously, because some of the processes often don't suit a lot of young people, never mind our young people, um, particularly in, in the beginning of, of their work. So that's it's a real partnership. Um, and it isn't just relying on one person inside the business. Um, human resources are involved, senior management, the team leader, and obviously the mentor or mentors. After COVID-19, not as many people are in the office. So sometimes you need two or three mentors. Of course, of course, Michael, and thank you for that. And I'll be coming back to you with some other questions later on. Delia, um, thank you for joining us. Michael uh, has mentioned uh, the importance of embedding it in policy, embed embedding the changes in policy. He's talked about uh, schemes in Ireland called PAT for funding. He's mentioned about the National uh, Access Plan and the uh, groups being named, like people with intellectual disabilities being named. You you have vast experience in relation to uh, the UNC, uh, UNCRPD, many of the other uh, human rights instruments. I, I wonder, Delia, could you perhaps provide us with some of the policy context in relation to access to education for persons with disabilities, both in Ireland, but, uh, but, but also at an EU and international level? Thank you very much. Um, so I would like to start by thanking the organizers for, for having me today. It's a great pleasure for me to have the opportunity to contribute to this panel. Um, so I would like to start by mentioning that the right to education is well rooted in international human rights law. It's a human right and everyone should enjoy this right. The right to education is proclaimed in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, in the International Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights, in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. However, it is the UNCRPD that you, Vivian, mentioned quite a few times that proclaims the right to inclusive education. And the word inclusive makes a lot of difference here. So the CRPD marks, uh, in my opinion, a step forward when we look at uh, uh, the right to education, because it requires state parties to create a system that welcomes everyone and give everyone, regardless their disability, the opportunity, as we were saying before, to learn and to engage in an educational setting. And I would like to draw your attention also to the fact that the inclusive education systems, according to the CRPD, should ensure the full development of human potential and sense of dignity and self-worth of everyone. And this should strengthen the respect for human diversity. And I think that this is a key obligation that states parties to the CRPD should comply with. Then, of course, uh, uh, Article 24, which is the article that provides for the right to education in the Convention, is quite complex and lengthy, and I'm not going into detail, but I just want to mention that uh, it requires state parties uh, uh, to ensure that reasonable accommodation is adopted in all educational settings to support the learning path of students uh, with disabilities. Uh, reasonable accommodation is essential, but it also uh, tallies with accessibility, broader accessibility measure. We need to make our curriculum accessible to everyone. And the CUPD is the key international standard when we look at uh, uh, the right to education, the right to inclusive education. But it also represents a bit more in Europe because the convention has been ratified by the European Union alongside its member states. And the Court of Justice of the European Union has 
clarify that the CRPD is now integral part of European Union law. And as such, it has a sub-constitutional status, which means that it's situated below the EU treaties, but above regulations and directives. And regulations and directives need to be implemented and interpreted in light and in compliance with the CRPD. The CRPD and the ratification of the CRPD in the European Union was a huge milestone for disability policies, and it has allowed the mainstreaming of disability across EU and um, the EU action. When it comes to education, um, you may uh, consider that the European Union has only a supporting competence. So Article 165 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union states that the European Union shall contribute to the development of quality education by encouraging cooperation between member states and if necessary, by supporting and supplementing their action. So the European Union has limited competencies when it comes to education, but it can do a lot in supporting member states when they enact system of inclusive education. And in fact, the European Disability Strategy 2010-2020 identified education as one of the key areas of action for the European Union. And the European Union committed, in particular the Commission, committed to support the goal of inclusive quality education and training through the use of its financial instrument, instruments that support the exchange of best practices, but also that support the exchange, uh, students' exchanges uh, or um, trainers or lecturers' exchange exchanges across Europe. And that was quite important. The following, the following strategy, the Strategy on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities 2021-2030, also place an emphasis on uh, quality education, and the need to ensure an education uh, education that reaches everyone, so it, access, it is accessible to everyone. Um, although the policy action of the European Union has been quite important so far, its impact in the field of education has been limited, and there has been a European uh, report from the European Court of Auditor that was released just a week ago, that uh, signals that uh, uh, the, we have a long road ahead. So the impact of the European Union policy in the fields of education uh, has been limited. But uh, this is also due to the fact that European Union legislation has not advanced as it could have. In fact, uh, discrimination on the ground of disability as well as on other ground is protected at the European Union level, but only with regard to employment and vocational training, but not with regard to access to education. A proposal that was put forward by the Commission in 2008, so quite a long time ago, is still stuck in the Council, uh, and uh, there has been a political disagreement over certain provisions of this uh, proposal for a directive that they extend the protection against discrimination on the ground of disability, among other grounds, in access to services, including educational services, but also social security and health. This proposal will be very, very important, and we hope that with the new commission that will uh, um, will enter, uh, will take office after the election in May 2024, this, new pro this proposal will be prioritized again. However, the EU has done a lot when it comes to accessibility. So there are two pieces of legislation, the, the Web Accessibility Directive and the European Accessibility Act, which is also a directive, that have been approved respectively in 2016 and in 2019. Those are not specifically um, focused on education or educational institutions, but they uh, enhance accessibility of 
tools that are used also in educational settings. So the website accessibility mandates the accessibility of all websites and application of public institutions, including educational institutions that are public. And this is quite important. So the website of a university needs to be accessible to people with disabilities that need to be able to, um, to engage with the content of that website, regardless of their disability. The European Accessibility Act includes um, a range of accessibility requirements for a lot of products, IT products mostly. But among those products, there are eBooks and the software related to eBooks. So in educational setting, books are important. They are a tool that we use every day. So I think the European Accessibility Act could really bring um, accessibility or widen accessibility in educational setting. On the whole, I think that uh, the European Union um, has uh, endeavored to mainstream disability across all its area of, areas of action. And uh, certainly um, education, regardless the fact that is an area of supporting competence, is an area in which the European Union has uh, done quite a lot so far. Maybe the impact is not yet visible in the member states, but it will be in the long run. We have also to say, uh, to say uh, as a last uh, uh, probably uh, note that inclusive education has become very visible as an objective and as a principle. In fact, it features in the European pillar of social rights in the first principle. It's, uh, it's, um, it is stated that everyone has the right to quality and inclusive education, training and lifelong learning. And I think this is a quite important affirmation that the pillar that was proclaimed uh, in, 27, in 2017 makes. So I think that uh, the European Union will uh, provide an important context also to develop national policies and to nudge member states towards more inclusive uh, systems. Delia, thank you very much. I mean, you have provided us with so much information in such a short spell uh, that uh, I'd imagine people are going to be really watching this a couple of times to try and take it all in and thank you. Um, I, I, you mentioned um, some of the resources and I, I totally agree with you that the Web Accessibility Directive is absolutely essential. And of course, uh, that it, it it's, there is a real necessity for it to be implemented as quickly as possible. Um, another, of course, a very useful tool which has been uh, introduced, of course, is the European Accessibility Resource Centre, uh, which I think is going to make a huge difference. And and, and that, I, I'm just very briefly before we go on to Michael, um, you mentioned about the the I suppose the backlog or the barriers there to bringing through the proposals around. Um, ed education proposals and, and making education more accessible and inclusive. I'm just wondering what is the role of the Council of Europe as another regional organization that may support inclusive education? And Adelia, I asked briefly because Michael, I want to give Michael an opportunity as well, of course. Thank you. Absolutely. I will try to be brief. So in, in Europe, alongside the European Union, the Council of Europe is an important regional organization. And in particular, the European Court on Human Rights has delivered quite a few uh, judicial decisions that are quite important uh, in terms of ensuring uh, uh, inclusive education. We have to uh, mention that case law of the, the Court of Human Rights, the European Court of Human Rights, has not always been consistent. So we do have some decisions that uh, um, are quite questionable, but we do have important decisions that clarify the role of inclusive education and they clarify the role of reasonable accommodation in uh, uh, inclusive education settings. And I want just to mention one recent case, which is JL versus Italy, in which the court cited the CRPD and also referred to the importance of inclusive education as 
the primary tool that we the, that members that states have to deploy when they organize their um, educational system. Yeah, I, and I think that's a very interesting point as well uh, around identifying or defining what inclusive education is. And I know in Ireland, there is a lot of discussion going on at the moment about what it is and, and how it's defined. And I think there's, I, I wonder at sometimes does that create some confusion or, 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 or maybe do we need to do a lot more work around it? But Michael, I, I need to finally get on to you and I'm, it's it's been so interesting so far and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you, you have to say. Uh, just to note, Michael is the head of unit schools and multilingualism in the European Commission's Directorate General for Education, Youth, Sport and Culture. Um, Michael, you, you'd like to maybe uh, elaborate a little bit more on around the, the policy um, and I suppose as well, perhaps, I mean, the importance of engaging with people to hear the lived experience. Yeah, thanks a lot, Vivian, and thanks a lot, uh, really, to the previous speakers. Uh, it was so interesting to listen. And I mean, the angle I would like to give to this that I mean, we've heard from 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 Michael Shevling, all young people should have the right and possibilities for education. Uh, we've heard it from uh, Saif that it's actually possible uh, in higher education, and what you've done there, Trinity and Delia set out the legal framework. That is actually very well developed, even case law. The issue we have is that we look at reality. I think it's uh, very far away from what all these um, legal texts uh, stipulate and from the cause. So that's something we think that is really a big, big, big challenge. I think uh, it's pretty clear what is asked for, uh, but it, we have still very, very far away for many, many people with disabilities to actually have their rights in practice, having them implemented, being a living experience. Maybe to, to make it very banal, I mean, we've seen this wonderful example that you showed, uh, you done, you've done in Trinity, and Saif is an example of this. Uh, Saif mentioned she did inclusive education in secondary. In most European countries, we actually are struggling to make inclusive education happen in primary and secondary education before we actually speak of, of, of uh, higher education. So the, the challenge is still huge. Yeah? So what are we doing? Well, as, as uh, Delia set out uh, so nicely, I mean, we, we, our role is sort of to, 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 to exchange good practice and uh, with a clear objective in mind. And the objectives are the ones you mentioned, inclusive education, the supporting of inclusive education for all pupils and students, irrespective of, of whether their individual situation is, is an objective is shared. And that's what this happened. And there we're trying to help countries to do it because we have good examples in some countries of Europe. Um, and we have some countries who are willing to learn from each other, from others. And so that's, that's a bit my job to, to support those countries. And we do it different ways. I mean, the one thing is we simply, we have these legal texts, and then we have a bit more medium level policy documents. I mean, one that the Council of Ministers, the representative, the body which brings together education ministers of all European Union member states has adopted a bit less than a year ago. It's called Pathways to School Success. So Pathways to School Success, success for all young people. And that includes also specific um, um, actions uh, for for people with disability is not a strategy about disability. It's about everyone who has challenges. But we have we address it as a particular target group, and there 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 there, there is a um, sort of reminder of of the need for countries when they set up their own policy strategies. For example, to think of different levels of of, of policy level, but also guidance given to school, education, continuous professional development being offered to teachers. Um, to getting a mixture between, on the one hand, more generalized support to all pupils that are in school, so have inclusive settings and the same measures for everybody, and some who need sort of some more targeted support to also provide that. So it's, it sets out a number of principles that should be developed. So that's one way we're doing. And then it's all nice to have this in a, in a, in a, in a, in a piece of paper. Well, it's nice. It's good because I, I don't want to play this small. If we all, if the council, all education ministers say that's what we want to do, we can also remind them that they've committed to this. 
And we then bring together experts um, from all countries who say, who to tell us on the one hand, if they have good examples and on the one hand, if they say, listen, I have questions. I want to um, want to uh, work on this, but I have some challenges. Can my neighbors please, can you please help me? So just in a few weeks, so I think in 10 days, we're bringing together member state representatives, but also some stakeholder organizations where they can simply exchange um, on good practice. And if everything goes well, they go back and say, let's say Lithuania or, or Ireland or, or wherever, whatever country they say, listen, we, we, we're developing a law here, we're developing a policy. I've seen something really interesting from country X, Y, or Z. So let's take some ideas from there when we develop our own um, own um, policies. Um, that's a bit always the happiest moment in my professional life if someone tells me, well, I've done and something at home that was really helpful and I was inspired by what I've seen in my neighboring country. Uh, so that's the good thing. We use for that, we have a European agency for special needs and inclusive education. It's not a European Union institution. It's a, it's a body that member states have created, but which also gets a lot of funding from the EU side in practices and also to support countries in sort of finding what works um, and uh, what is um, what is difficult and to inspire others. And um, last but not least, what we do is, is the Erasmus program, the Erasmus Plus program, which is a uh, program about policy cooperation, mobility, where we also try, try to provide opportunities for, 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 for also for people with all sorts of inclusion issues, including people for the, with disabilities. Michael, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, description of what happens and what what you're doing what what grabbed my attention was that you you noted the um i suppose the difference between what's in law uh and and those laws that exist like the uncrpd we've got our un sdgs we've got our disability uh, which we haven't mentioned yet which i'm i know many people are always very interested in talking about but what i'm trying to get to is that what would help uh, policymakers uh, like you actually move the dial forward, um, and and I think as well, and another part to that as well, as a disability rights activist, um, mm -hmm. as well, I, I and other disability rights activists often see um, a big gap between say us and policymakers. How do we close that gap? How do we bring that, as I said, the dial forward here? I mean, the my policy, my work wouldn't be worth anything if, in some way, I could not see it's actually helpful for people. I mean, I hate. Uh, okay, sometimes it happens. Uh, you, 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 if you do these jobs, you sometimes write documents that is just uh, for an organization. But at the end of the day, we are there uh, to support uh, colleagues in the countries, so, but actually learners themselves. I mentioned the Erasmus program before. I mean, one of the things we're really trying to, 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 to work on is that when we have this program, Erasmus Plus, which is very well known in higher education, schools, and vocational training, that everybody can really participate. So, which means everybody is everybody. So also learners with disability. So that's something we've worked on a bit in the past years that uh, very concretely we've we've in our implementing body so the Erasmus program is always implemented with the help of national partner organizations so that we ask all of them first you please develop your own strategy that's still paper but then really get out to the people uh, i mean on the one hand show what's possible because for example in Erasmus if you have special needs either because of disability, but also because of other reasons. It can be um, a very poor background in a particular part of a town, for example, and all this. I mean, the institutions, they can visit each other. I mean, if Michael, for example, did an exchange program and he had and a partner university somewhere else in Europe had doubts of the feasibility because they have less experience than Michael and Trinity have, then we would he would get some extra support to sort of simply to to, to, to visit this other institution, to welcome them, and to prepare the exchange that would be organized a bit later on. So there's some extra work. If people have the needs of, of let's say, simply some health support, and we've had students with, um, how do you say, dialyse, I mean, where you have uh, kidney problems and you have uh, 
you did you didn't need quite important medical care during the stay your stay abroad you can get it you can get some extra support in terms of financial means and i think one of the so that's available but it also needs to be known so we're trying also to ask our colleagues in our national agencies to reach out uh, to the education institutions and to 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 to, to groups to tell us what they need in order to 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 be able to 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 participate in our program, and um, I mean I spoke a lot about mobility now, and we actually in Erasmus Plus we have mobility opportunities for for school pupils, for vet learners, for 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 higher education, but we also have quite many programs that we have where we also organize with the program exchange of good practice, uh, so that uh, a college can work with another college across Europe, a school with another network of schools across Europe to see. How can I organize myself uh, that uh, that um, that it's we become more inclusive, or that we have teacher training programs? And I, that's the last point. We have currently something we call Erasmus Plus Teacher Academies. We actually have one of the teacher academies which is looking specifically at how can inclusive education be better integrated into initial teacher education and continuous professional development in Europe. So again, there join teacher education institution across Europe to make them learn from each other. Yeah, and, and, and those are really critical steps, I think, uh, that we have been doing a lot of work in terms of teacher education here in, in Ireland too, um, and ensuring that, um, that that teachers are aware and disability aware, but also uh, I think as well that teachers act as role models uh, for young students and of course encouraging uh, disabled people to go into teaching too, which is very important. Um, one of the things that which we, we have aware of in terms of barriers for people uh, undertaking Erasmus Plus uh, has been country regulations in relation to the provision of supports. So for instance, PA supports, uh, where certain countries won't allow you to transfer your PA allocation supports to the host country, um, which acts as a barrier. How, how do we overcome those individual country regulations in order to 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 create that mobilization and to support that mobilization um i don't have a specific uh, reply here now but it's, yes of course if it's a uh, for us uh, uh, i mean for me this is quite outrageous this example because if you're an exchange student you of course remain uh i mean if uh, you remain still a student in your country organization you're sent um, uh, for a short period or a longer period to another one and normally the the um, the way at least in the, in the case of Erasmus the way this works is that we try to cover the extra cost incurred by the mobility experience mm. uh, so normally um, the the um, I mean everything which is already there at the national level uh, should normally uh, be there, uh, uh, at least when it's in the, within the European Union, uh, because you're, you're not you're going there on a temporary basis. Uh, but if there are individual regulations, we always have them. Also for we actually also have them also for people not with disabilities for other invocational training. It's a typical uh, issue of health and safety regulations and vocational training that it, that employers have insurance problems when, when they have work, when they have, when they have vocational students go for a while away. I mean, that's about our daily business. We try to work with the legislature in those countries. We try to see if there are any exceptions uh, in, in law, uh, which can say that uh, for this short period or longer period, it's still the case. Um, um, I mean, we, yeah, it's a continuous way of trying to convince and trying to, to reform uh, the, the, the small things which need to be changed. Yeah. Of course, yeah, absolutely, and, and that's the constant challenge uh, that that uh, I think we all face in in trying to bring about the change. Um, the Michael, if if Michael Chevlin, if I could perhaps come back to you uh, in relation to um, access to education, but and mainstreaming uh, uh, access to education, uh, the UNCRPD advocates the inclusion of disabled people. Uh, in their communities, including in mainstream classrooms, um, you you've you've written uh, that we are at a crossroads in relation to mainstream um, 
mainstreaming education or to remain in special school class model. Would you be able to explain that and why it's important? Well, I think it's, as you said earlier, like the, the whole inclusion debate about what actually constitutes inclusion. What is it? What does it look like? What does it feel like? And I think this varies enormously. And I think we've made significant progress in Ireland and different research studies, different practices that I've seen, some really lovely examples of how you include everybody, not just youngsters with disabilities. But the difficulty goes into, I think, the things that underpin our system. We have a very, we still have this obsession with fixed ability thinking. And we believe that uh, everyone gets a certain amount of intelligence and this is their quotient and that's what will matter. And, and it really disempowers everybody. And I think, and then we have a system where there's high stakes testing. And so everything gets directed in a particular way, which is how do we get people through the, these exams, um, particularly at second level. And it's very interesting that the vast majority of youngsters with uh, intellectual disabilities in special schools are of secondary school age, which is telling us something. Either parents are worried that their children won't survive or they've survived well in, in primary, but not in post-primary. Their, their fear is. And yet I've seen wonderful examples, but we, we haven't been able to make it consistent and that it's a guarantee that young people will be included. And I thought it was really significant what Saif was saying about being valued, about feeling that they belong. And I know young people in our program have said, this is the first time I've ever felt that I belong. This is the first time in work I felt valued. And there's something wrong when that's the first time, you know, and it's telling us, and we do know what to do. I mean, it's not rocket science. We do know there's plenty of pedagogy out there. There's plenty of expertise. There's plenty of knowledge about how to make a curriculum accessible, how to ensure that young people can be successful learners. And that's our key aim with our program is that the young people will be successful learners. There are all kinds of things in the way. As I said, the high stakes testing, the fixed ability thinking, which distorts how we work with children and it's sort of as i said it's it's so um pessimistic whereas education should be about optimism about what's possible um and to believe then that this has already been decided this child will only be able to progress so far and then we justify a restricted curriculum on the basis of that and we had a young person and Sai will know this person very well who's learning italian with us at the moment and she came out the other day and it was as if she was on a total high. She was speaking Italian. People were sending her messages in Italian. She was sending messages back. And she said, I never believed that I could learn another language. And I think that's what I find a little frustrating, that we do know what to do. We do know how to do it. Um, but different things conspire. I don't think... I think the fact that we're opening up so many new special classes doesn't help because it hasn't been, we haven't said, what do these mean? You know, if they were resource classes where the child belonged to a base class, and then they may need, and I've seen examples in Ireland where children spend 80% of their time in the mainstream class. Uh, and then they need different types of support. And I know in the research I've done, some young people have said, I really value the one to one that and that gets me over the hump. That gets me over the, the immediate difficulty. And then I can move on. I'm empowered. I can move on and, and, and I feel confident. What happens is a lot of these supports become embedded. And that's where the children get stuck and the teachers get stuck. And some of it is to do with the funding models. You know, where we say that's what we were trying to talk about myself and Dr. Joanne Banks, my colleague in, in that article that you mentioned, that we say a special class is this is what it is. And it's a physical entity. Now, the clever schools use the resource of the extra teacher or other assistants and the other types of supports that come in. 
Um, but that isn't widespread enough. Okay. That makes sense. <clears throat> that makes absolute uh, sense to me. And I, I think that we need to be cognizant of our, our obligations under the UNCRPD uh, and the, the, the need to move towards uh, and continue to move towards mainstreaming uh, of service and inclusion of disabled people in all aspects of our community. Um, and that uh, it, it, I think, uh, from my own perspective, it's certainly of, of concern to see uh, an increase in the number of special schools, special classes uh, in the system. And it's interesting. Uh, well, does anybody have a comment on that? Delia, have you any thoughts in, in relation to the mainstreaming? Um, well, in relation to, to the mainstreaming, I think it's important uh, that uh, um, we continue to learn from each other. And in this respect, the European Union um, is, is really a good environment to, 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 to learn from best practices uh, and to try and implement them nationally. But I would like also to pick up very briefly on something that was mentioned earlier. So the portability of certain benefits uh, or allowances uh, that are um, within the remit of national second, uh, welfare systems. So in the European Union, unfortunately, there is a, a coordination of social security system, but there is no harmonization whatsoever. And that is a block when it comes to the portability of certain uh, uh, non-contributory benefits. However, um, I just want to mention a, a recent development that doesn't, unfortunately, uh, change the situation with regard to social security and social assistance, but still may 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 make uh, you know travel across Europe for people with disabilities, young people with disabilities easier. So the Commission presented on the sixth of September the proposal for a European disability card. So the card will be of course, created at the national level and given to people that qualify as persons with disabilities according to that national system. But it will allow people that go abroad to have their disability status recognized and to avail of certain services or facilities on the basis of that card. And uh, I think this is a quite important development. At present, it's only a proposal. It's a proposal for a directive. And it mentions, unfortunately, short stays. So uh, an Erasmus stay of six months doesn't seem to fall in the current scope of the proposal. But uh, the European Disability Forum is actually pushing towards uh, um, enlarging the material scope of the proposal uh, with regard to the possibility for, for instance, students that go um, on Erasmus uh, to use the card abroad to avail of certain services when they are abroad. And I think that this is an important development. We will see what happens uh, because we are at the very beginning. But again, I think we, we need also to look at what is possible and to try and uh, um, uh, in particular, push towards the realization of the rights that are proclaimed into the CRPD as far as we can with all the tools that are available at the policy and legislative levels. Absolutely, Delia. And I think you're, I'm, I'm really delighted that you, you mentioned the, uh, that to the, about the, the card uh, and the, I think it's going to make a, a significant difference. Um, Michael Teich, can I, can, I, can I bring you in here at this point here? Um, that uh, in, in relation, maybe you might have some comment on on the two items that have, have been raised, but but also I have a specific question as well. Uh, there's a number of questions coming in here now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, in relation to how do we, um, or how in the you within your work, how do you include uh, disabled people themselves uh, in the decision making processes, uh, but also in the making and shaping uh, of policies relating to education? Yeah, good question. Uh, the I mean, we try to uh, engage with all the stakeholders that we have. Uh, in uh, when preparing uh, new pieces of legislation like the Pathways to School Success I mentioned, we did a public 
consultation uh, about two years ago, uh, where we also reached out to, 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 to stakeholder organizations. Um, I don't know, I don't remember now whether, for example, the European Disability Forum that uh, Delia mentioned um, uh, participated there. Uh, the European Agency of Special Needs Education um, and Inclusive Education is a regular um, member of our um, of our um, um, of our working group implementing these pathways to school success um, um, policy. I was just mentioning, and as I mentioned, also when we look at the Erasmus guidelines, uh, we have. Uh, sort of uh, um, giving instructions to our, to our national implementing organization to reach out to national um, uh, stakeholder organizations. How good we were there specifically in terms of disability um, uh, organizations, I, uh, I would need to check, I would, I, I would need to know. But we try to do now also, for example, to get, give children's a voice in our consultations process, because that's also quite important given that we work in education which is for education, so don't listen only to the adults, uh, but also uh, ask children's, um, children, uh, so um, definitely yes. Um, I mean, on the, on the portability of the, of, the, of the budget that you mentioned, and uh, that also Delia referred to the, uh, to the legal framework, it's true that there's a, I mean, the social security coordination is, is the way that Delia described it, um, it's not harmonized, but of course it's a huge thing, which where where countries are very much afraid of portability of uh, of um, of uh, benefits from one country to the other. I mean, we are constantly struggling with uh, well, how do you interpret a, a six month stay, for example? For me, it's still a temporary, short term stay where you don't lose your affiliation to your home country, yeah? you're not settling. If I go to Italy, when I did my Erasmus to Italy, I did not settle permanently in Italy. Of course, I registered with the university there, I registered with the municipality, but I told them, listen, I'm a guest student here for five months and then I'm going back. And my university wanted to have me back. So I just read, have a book on at home, which of an activist, in, I'm German, a German activist uh, saying, okay, on inclusion saying, Listen, uh, the people who believe in inclusion, they find solutions. Those who don't know, they find excuses. So that's a typical case. I mean, uh, how the, 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 the budget, the cost can be very, cannot be very high in terms of transferring the, 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 the personal uh, assistance budgets for, 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 for disability. So if they don't want to, sorry, it's part of the excuses. And I think there we, we try to, to help in individual cases. Sometimes it's possible, but it's uh, well. There are big challenges there. So we're very, we're very much. I mean, I mean, what you see also from my reply that the, the challenge we have it's it's very often still on the goodwill, one by one, case by case decisions where we have sensible people um, cooperating, and of course we still have to come become better in sort of making it the right for everybody, and also making this right happen, <laughs> so that to get the more inclusive and the more. Um, the more specific regulations. I think it it is it's very uh, it's an eye opener for me, um, mm. and I imagine for the audience here as well, from Michael, to hear the challenges that you as uh, a policymaker uh, and in your role face in terms of uh, trying to bring about change too. And I think that is very useful because obviously, uh, often that's not perhaps considered, um, uh, especially from an activist pr perspective, uh, that, you, you know, I guess people in your position might be seen as a gatekeeper or maybe the reason why something hasn't changed. Whereas in actual fact, you, you're, you're very much painting a picture about the very significant challenges that you too face trying to make changes. So it's it's quite interesting to hear that perspective too. I'm coming on coming back around now to Saiv. Saiv, I hope you've had a, an opportunity to take a breath after your wonderful presentation. And I just want to bring you in here at this point because I'm thinking uh, of the question I asked Michael uh, Toysh about including disabled people in decision making mm -hmm. uh, and being involved in policy making. And I think you're probably yes. best placed to answer a, a question in relation to that. And uh, during during your time in college, uh, mm -hmm. were you involved in any leadership or decision making roles that maybe you'd like to tell us about? 
Um, so I was uh, a S2S, I was asked to uh, be an S2S uh, mentor with my with myself and my, with my friends um, for the first time I, in the course. And it was a, it was great, but um, we didn't get the proper training to, so we, so we, so we didn't exactly know exactly what we what we were supposed to be doing. So we didn't know. Um, but I recently uh, did the training since then, so now I understand the, what the what the role would have been. You get what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, no, and uh, uh, that's that's important. And I know, of course, you were involved in the disability rights module as well, Sive. Uh, yes. And uh, uh, I think you 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 invited a minister in to a minister of to, to discuss the issues. Maybe you'd quickly tell us about that. Um. So we um we invited the uh, minister for education to Trinity. And so it was a very interesting um, conversation because, you know, as you know, he's very involved in, um, he's very into, you know, making sure that education is accessible for students with intellectual disabilities. And, you know, his uh, brother is part of, as I am, uh, the, um, for autism, students with autism. Of course, yeah, um, and that's right. absolutely, yeah. Uh, that, uh, <clears throat> and I see we have uh, another. Uh, I think I'm just saying, in terms of time, I think we're coming close to the end. So I, I think I'm not sure I'm going to get to the last question. Mm -hmm. But in terms of uh, if anybody has any general comments uh, that they would like to add now before we we come to uh, to to come to tidying up, has anyone anything they'd like to add? Well, on that basis, then, uh, Adelia, I am going to ask you a question. Um, I, I, despite the significant progress, there exists many obstacles that limit access to education for persons with disabilities. And we've heard about some of those here today, and uh, including like the failure to implement the human rights model of disability um, and maybe low expectations within mainstream settings. Antonio Guterres commented uh, in relation to the rights of disability that that we're at, we are at he was a fear that we are, uh, are at a stage where we may risk reversing what the progress that we have made uh, was his comment uh, do you feel that we are in danger of reversing when it comes to the rights to education for persons with disabilities in the eu so I don't think we are in 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 this uh, in this situation, but I do think that we need to be alert and we need to continue working. So I think uh, we we need to look at what has been done, but bring this forward. To really, that's essential. So although I don't see in, in Europe in particular and in certain parts of Europe more than in others, I don't see the risk of reversing. I see a very important role played by people with disabilities in advocacy, uh, both at the national level and the European level. So I don't see the risk of reversing, but I do see the need to advance the rights and to continue because we are very far away from, you know, realizing what has been uh, what has been stated, what is stated in the CRPD. So there is a long road ahead. Mm. So that's what I think. And in terms of uh, the European Union, I again I think that. Uh, it has the potential to really support the member states to deliver on inclusive education. But, it, it, you know, there is the need to keep the commitment there and to support inclusive practices, to support a continuous dialogue co with people with disabilities. And I think you've actually hit on a very important point, Delia, which is the inclusion uh, of disabled people's organisations, disabled people themselves, uh, in those in those roles, Michael Toys, you have your hand uh, up there. Would you like to make a comment? Yes, and thank you so much, uh, Vivian, also for the question. Um, no, also I think this this uh, involvement of people with disabilities themselves. I mean, that's that 
that's, uh, I, I said, we can become better, but of course the documents that Delia mentioned, our strategies, uh, implementing models, of course, they are all developed uh, in dialogue and and uh, and in common use. I mean, I see um, I see certain risks. So I think there's no risk that we go backwards when it comes to the legal framework. Uh, but when sometimes when I see in terms of let's say really pushing for the inclusive models via segregated education models. I mean, like Michael mentioned also, the, the, the class, special classes or special schools. I, mean, I see some countries where it goes back and forth. I mean, including countries which have tried. There are, unfortunately, a number of uh, countries in uh, Europe where there have been elections where certain projects that have encountered practical difficulty, difficulties for implementation, they were not perfect. Uh, but they were sort of where the governments then decided to, uh, to 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 go some steps backwards. There are some regions in Germany happened. It has the Flemish community in Belgium. Uh, there are some other countries where where really there's a risk of of uh, this sort of idea of inclusive education rather than segregated not being um, taken forward enough. But I don't want to sound too pess pessimistic or too negative. Because I really like what Michael also said earlier today. I mean, there's so wonderful examples out there, and I also that gives my myself uh, satisfaction for the job. That also, when we look at Erasmus projects, that, that, that where we see institutions working together, coming with solutions, they come with in, with solutions. They have happy teachers and well trained professionals at the end who are satisfied with their job, and they have absolutely enthusiastic learners in the institutions at the end. So there are so many good examples. There's huge difficulties, but I mean, there's so many good examples that, that really keeps the community promoting these values driving. There's huge challenges. I mean, but I sometimes, for me at least, sometimes I get sometimes I get angry because I'm also privately, I'm also a father uh, of a child with, uh, with Down syndrome. So sometimes you get frustrated, but you see some wonderful examples that sort of keep you also as a, as a professional working and where is where I can go to teachers and tell them, listen, I've seen this there. And the teachers themselves tell me I've participated in an Erasmus project that really has helped me thrive, has supported my learners. And we've seen it also here today. So I think there is reason for optimism to continue this this uh, discussion and sometimes battle even. Uh, but I think we should, I would like to finish a bit on a positive note. And and I think that is an absolute uh, the, the absolute best way to to finish our session here today. Uh, and thank you very much to all our speakers, uh, Sai Fien, uh, for a fantastic uh, presentation on her lived experience. And well done, Sai. Uh, to you. Professor Michael Shevlin, Shevlin in the School of uh, Education, uh, Trinity College, Double, Dublin. And of course, Delia Ferry in the All Institute in Munich University. And of course, uh, Michael Teich uh, from the head of unit in uh, his department. All of you, thank you very much for a wonderful session. I hope our audience has enjoyed it as much as I have enjoyed it, and I hope you all got something from it. This will be uh, this event is recorded, and the recording will be up online. I hope you all have a lovely afternoon. Take care. Uh, goodbye. <laughs>